Good morning. How's everybody? Good to see you all. Welcome back. And for those of you who weren't here yesterday, welcome. We're delighted to have all of you here. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, we're looking forward to an extremely energetic set of discussions today. We're very grateful to all of you for being here for day two of our, well, really the main day of our SIGU conference. And we begin with um, emergent agrarian environments. And I wanted to thank my friend, comrade, former professor of mine, Professor Gary Harrigal of the Political Science Department for starting us off on moderating the panel. Gary. Thank you, <coughs> Neil, former student of mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm very excited about this panel. You know, agriculture is, as you probably saw from the presentation yesterday, a, a very central factor in the current climate crisis, and strategies for mitigation in that area are really very uh, important to uh, consider. And you know, <clears throat> agriculture is also central, as you can probably think, to the uh, food system, and we have a health crisis that surrounded uh, that system and agriculture is playing a central role in that. And it's also, you could uh, claim <coughs> uh, a really important way in which you can sort of diagnose the orientation that a society and a civilization has to nature and the way in which it expresses itself. And so I'm very happy to have um, <coughs> three panelists here who provide us with uh, very different, but uh, interestingly complementary perspectives on how to think about agriculture, how to approach it as a, as a problem, and uh, <clears throat> they pursue uh, their craft with uh, you know, a, a wide array of methods and um, lots of really rich empirical material. So I'm extremely excited to um, you know, monitor this panel and to have this panel going on. And so what we have is uh, <clears throat> first, I guess we have Yvette Perfecto from the University of Michigan. Yvette is uh, the James E. Crawford Professor of Environmental Justice at the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. She's a veteran. Uh, she's more than 35 years. Of, she's a veteran in the study of <laughs> agriculture and agroecology. Um, yeah, really years of experience working on issues of agriculture and the environment. Her research focuses on agroecology, biodiversity, uh, diversity, and ecosystem services and agricultural landscapes. And uh, she has uh, a, a very impressive uh, list of uh, awards and uh, associations and honors uh, associated with her scholarship. So we're very happy to have her uh, here on the panel. And uh, then we have uh, <clears throat> we also have uh, Helen Ann Curry from. Uh, Georgia Tech. She's the Melvin Kranzberg Professor in the History of Technology at the School of History and Sociology at Georgia in, at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. Uh, she is an honorary research fellow at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, University of Cambridge, and uh, we are very happy to have her perspective here on uh, integrating the sort of social studies of science to the study of agriculture and to the study, to the historical study of agriculture. And then finally, we have <coughs> Max, uh, uh, I never know how to say your last name, Max Agil. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at Ghent University <coughs> and a researcher with the Tunis. Tunistan Observatory for Food Sovereignty and the Environment. He's the editor of the Agrarian South and uh, Journal of Labor and Society, and uh, he's been an active in he's been active in anti-war politics and is the author of a recent book, A People's Green New Deal, with Pluto Press. And he, uh, from in my private ordering of how this panel is set up, we have a historian, an agroecologist, and a, a political economist thinking about uh, agriculture, and Max carries that um, side of things. So uh, without further ado, we have 15 minutes per presentation, uh, and we're going to go Helen, Yvette, and then uh, Max, if that's okay. So Helen, thank you. All right. Um, thanks very much to the organizers of this wonderful event for the invitation uh, to participate and, and, and share um, some of my ideas about the very important questions that this conference raises. Um, and I'm going to start, I think, by, by framing um, a little bit more even than has been done in the introduction, the perspective that I bring to the questions that animate this workshop. So as has been said, I'm a historian of science and technology. And my research and reflections have really focused on the history of agricultural science and agricultural technologies. 
from uh, genetic engineering and its role in the creation of industrial monocrops to community seed banks and their place in imagining alternative agrarian futures. Although I started my career with an emphasis on technologies and transformations in the United States, I've increasingly followed the threads of research programs in crop science and other domains as they stretched across countries and continents, uh, especially in the guise of international development work. So when it comes to um, uh, engaging with or intervening in emergent agrarian environments of the 21st century, understanding the trajectory of scientific and technological agendas, impositions, and imaginaries is utterly crucial. So much of the transformation that we've seen in styles and standards of agricultural production, especially since World War II, arose from, first, belief in a singular agricultural modernity defined by the adoption of synthetic inputs, quote unquote, better seeds, like those of the miracle rice that you see uh, illustrated in the image here, uh, machinery, irrigation, and more generally, the reconfiguration of farming as a business. And second, the belief that gains in productivity arising from this modern agro-tech assemblage would enable the sidestepping of land reform, would free labor for industrial activities, would eliminate rural and, and potentially politically threatening poverty. In other words, so much of global agrarian transformation has revolved around a story, a narrative, about science and technology, and the faith that these could be used to sidestep difficult political choices. And, of course, it revolves around the reality of their having ultimately sustained the political objective of forcing open food and agricultural markets to transnational capital. So, History tells us that science and technology are deeply implicated in the sustainability and the equity crises of contemporary agriculture. But how might history help us entertain new possibilities? How might it help us to address emergent crises? Some of the things that I've been trying to do in my recent research with these varied questions in mind are to examine more closely narratives of crisis themselves, to understand the work that they do, uh, two, to think about proposals for alternative ways of doing science for agriculture, to see where those have led, because of course we have many historical examples of that as well. And then also to think about moments where diverse pathways have been shut down in the hopes that that history can offer some insight into the actions that we take in the future. So I'm going to illustrate these three uh, possibilities briefly, drawing on examples that I have from my research. Uh, in the hopes that these can be contributions to this conversation about method and action uh, in, in the area of uh, climate and environmental crises. And I'll start with narratives of crisis. So there's obviously, I think, a significant literature now on crisis thinking. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, the way in which crisis thinking can constrain possibilities for action as well as motivate it. Right? So I'm thinking here of the crisis and crisis and, and other reflections. And I've engaged with this in my research on the history of efforts to conserve crop genetic diversity. Such efforts, for example, involve the placing of seeds of farmers' varieties taken from agrarian environments around the world and placing them in seed and gene banks for long-term preservation. Long-term conservation seed banks have been in development since the 1930s, and for almost as long, they have been motivated by an understanding that farmers' varieties, which are rich in genetic diversity as a result of their being cultivated in distinct agro-ecosystems and cultural contexts, will inevitably be replaced by professional breeders' creations. That's the story. And this concomitant loss of diversity is thought to constrain the possibilities for future agricultural development, that is to say, the breeding of new crop varieties. And researchers have pushed for the collection and storage of farmers' varieties of seeds, uh, sorry, seeds of farmers' varieties, in order to stave off this possibility. Uh, in some cases, urging this as early as the 1890s, right? So well more than a century um, of, of action on this front. In doing so, those researchers inevitably emphasize the extreme urgency of taking this kind of action, typically predicting an impending wipeout of farmers' varieties uh, as a result of agricultural transformations. Uh, whether those transformations were hybrid corn in the 1930s and 40s, green revolution, wheat and rice in the 1970s, or transgenic varieties since the 1990s. Basically the same sort of story about 
uh, inevitable uh, uh, disappearance is written around all of those um, moments. So if one's concerned about the sustainability of agriculture and biodiversity loss, it's really tempting to latch on to this narrative of crisis and the clear techno-scientific solution of seed bank preservation. However, one of the insights that emerges from looking at the 100 plus year history of efforts to conserve crop diversity is that narratives of crisis in this space have basically always served the interests of agro-industry, which benefits from seeds being kept in carefully cataloged, easily accessed collections and rarely, if ever, benefits the farmers whose future is written off just like the survival of their seeds in fields is. And to a certain extent, I think the champions of preserving heritage and heirloom seeds, folks who really are truly engaged in the, in the, in the good work of conserving agrobiodiversity uh, uh, in many ways, are also implicated in this counterproductive crisis talk. Because those categories suggest that all the diversity that we can have in agricultural crops is behind us, right? It's something that was produced in the past and is ever dwindling. But of course, unlike endangered wild plants and animals, we can keep remixing. We can genuinely create diversity in agriculture. That's what farmers who still participate in traditional seed systems do. And that's ultimately who we need to be uh, protecting and defending and supporting. Uh, and we need to think if a crisis, uh, crisis talk in, in terms of crop biodiversity loss supports that agenda. Now I'm going to move on to my second intervention, which arises from the knowledge that I am certainly not the first person to make that uh, observation or intervention that I just made. Uh, indeed, a lot of really awesome work in conservation of crop biodiversity since the 1990s has gone into what's called in situ conservation, so conservation on site or in farmers' fields. Uh, and this work has been sustained by a broader farm system and farmer-centered research agenda that took shape in the years immediately following the declaration of a green revolution in agricultural production. And when I use the phrase green revolution here, I, I'm referring specifically to changes resulting from the introduction of so-called high-yielding wheat and rice and the inputs and the banking structures and, and other things needed to sustain their cultivation uh, in the 1960s. So the alternative research agenda, uh, the alternative to the Green Revolution that I'm referring to, responded to criticisms made of the Green Revolution, especially its effects in exacerbating social inequality, basically missing out on poorer or, or marginalized farmers, and to some extent the ill effects of industrial approaches and new crops on, on environments as well. So even at the institutions considered the epicenter of the Green Revolution model, namely the International Agricultural Research Centers supported through the International Consortium CGIAR. Researchers were funded from the 1970s to devise science and technology that would be more appropriate to farmers on the margins. Technologies that would recognize farmer knowledge and expertise that would be economically and socially sustainable. To recognize women as significant actors in agriculture, among other things. Basically, research to respond to the critiques of uh, the Green Revolution. And it's my feeling that historians have not been very good at acknowledging this. Uh, we've definitely helped with the project of showing that the Green Revolution approaches were short-sighted, politically motivated, in some cases did great harm. But we've not appreciated that many researchers and multiple institutions recognized the problems, even from an early moment, and tried to do better. And that, I think, is a missed opportunity for all of us to think about why it's so difficult to develop or implement alternative pathways. So one way that I've tried to think about this question recently is to look at how history, um, at the history of how research on sweet potato was in, uh, introduced into the international agricultural research system. Sweet potato was and is incredibly uh, important globally as a highly nutritious, high yielding, low input subsistence crop. Yet despite ranking seventh among uh, crops globally in terms of cultivation since the 1970s, it was very low priority within international institutions initially. Basically, it wasn't a commodity crop and, and for lots of um, uh, uh, reasons was not thought worthy of, of significant investigation for that reason. Um, but this meant that it was actually a very good route for some of those same institutions of the Green Revolution to demonstrate their commitment to correcting the course of the Green Revolution in the 1980s. Doing this was not at all easy. Uh, sweet potatoes were not homogenized like other crops. They're wildly diverse in terms of cultivators and cultivation crops. Uh, uh, sorry, in cultivation contexts. 
And so research demanded more social science to understand those production contexts, uh, new techniques for managing germplasm collections, and so on. One of the uh, big challenges that I've looked into was figuring out international conventions for descriptions of sweet potato characteristics in order to facilitate the exchange of specimens and data without at the same time flattening or obscuring the rich diversity of the plant or its farmers, since this had come to be a concern. So as my research has shown, both among natural scientists and social scientists, this problem gave rise to new systems, but systems that were so encompassing of and flexible towards diversity that they basically proved ultimately to be unimplementable. Uh, and I find this history humbling. I think it's easy to be critical of science that ignores or erases diversity and complexity, that is to say, the, the historiography of the Green Revolution. Uh, but it's much harder to grapple with the lessons of research that really tries to do better and still flounders. But we actually need to do more of that uh, as historians and other scholars to appreciate the constraints that are imposed on any uh, attempted intervention. Uh, in the case of naming conventions, by requirements sometimes as mundane as database maintenance, and at other times as foundational as inter-intelligibility across borders. And that brings me to my third and final and hopefully briefest point. Um, chasing the history of responses to the Green Revolution, so attempts to broaden out from one target and one pathway towards a multiplicity of agricultural futures, has also to led me to wonder about those moments when multiple pathways and possibilities are narrowed. And I've specifically been interested in the role of agricultural extension in this history. So agricultural extension, of course, refers to institutionalized means of delivering knowledge and technologies to farmers, a process that's typically associated with states and sites that have invested in off-farm agricultural research or knowledge making and who want to then deliver this knowledge to farmers. So extension is interesting because uh, on the surface it feels like it should be a space of negotiation between supposed universals on the one hand and local ecological and cultural realities on the other, a site for the kind of tailoring of general uh, insights into specific circumstances. And yet many historians implicate extension in processes like farm consolidation and capitalization, and more generally the advance of industrial monoculture favoring large farms and ultimately corporate interests in, in, in big ag and big food. But work, what work have extension agents understood themselves to be doing? While studying the history of efforts to conserve corn diversity, I bumped into the work of an early US extension worker, who's the man holding the box here on the left uh, of the image. Um, he was the first county extension agent in Iowa. Uh, and I learned about his work teaching farmers about the importance of their investing in seed care uh, and seed testing. So he used yearly local demonstrations to show farmers that corn yields weren't just about the skill of the farmer or about the ecology of a particular farm, that the quality of the seed they were using mattered, and that farmers could improve on the quality of the seed they planted through simple improvement of on-farm seed keeping and selection, and that they could do this with far better results than they would obtain by purchasing seed from seed companies at the time. So despite this extension agent's determination to enhance farmers' skills and improve local resources through extension, the corn demonstrations at the heart of his process ultimately ended up being even more effective as advertisements for certain farmers' seeds. Through pathways that I'm not going to describe uh, here, he and his demonstrations ended up being major contributors to the development of an F1 hybrid corn seed industry in the U.S. Corn Belt, an event that's associated with significant de-skilling of farmers and a loss of their autonomy, ultimately, in seed selection. And I've been puzzling over this example recently and what to make of the irony that an extension program designed specifically to inculcate practices of seed care and to develop locally adapted seed would lead in this seemingly direct line to a powerful hybrid corn seed industry that more or less eliminated both of these things uh, in the Corn Belt. And one thing I think for sure is that it serves as a reminder that well-meaning, thoughtful attention to providing local site-specific solutions can indeed still give way to the opposite when the overarching framework for research and extension does not also prioritize those things. And that's a lesson from history that I think uh, should be interesting to all of us interested in more local site-specific sustainable <laughs> solutions to agricultural problems. I'll close there, uh, and I look forward to the conversation that follows. Thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Helen. Now we have a. Oh, we're going to do. Okay. Thanks. 
We need to change this. Ah, we need to. <laughs> um, and and uh, maybe I. And then, do you know? Ah. That looks great. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today, uh, and I look forward for, to the conversations that we're going to have later. Um, so we all know about the, the consequences of industrial agriculture, uh, and uh, it is important to emphasize that the global food system, the industrial uh, food system, is at the heart of many of the crises that we are uh, seeing today, uh, especially environmental crises. Now, to start with, this is something that has been mentioned several times already in this conference. Uh, the, food, the global food system is uh, the single most contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, with an estimate of a, about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions coming from this sector. But today, I'm here to talk about biodiversity. Uh, and uh, in this slide, you can see, uh, according to the WWF, which monitors close to 32,000 populations, representing more than 5,000 species, uh, the, the, these um, have been lost, basically, uh, at a rate of uh, 69%. So from 1970 to 2018, the Global Living Planet Index, which is an index of the loss of biodiversity, declined by 69%. Uh, the worldwide loss of insects is simply staggering, uh, with some reports showing more than 75% loss in flying insect biomass. Uh, and this is even within protected areas. So this is, this is a, study, a study that was done in, in Germany in protected areas. This is really important because insects provide important ecosystem services like pollination, biological control, which is an area that I work uh, with. Uh, the, they are decomposers of organic matter. Uh, they aerate the soil uh, in, um, sorry. Oh, yeah, they aerate the soil, and they are also food for other organisms, uh, like birds, for example. So when insects are gone, so are the birds, and we're left with the silent spring that Rachel Carson talked about, you know, in her prophetic words many years ago. In the, in the 50 years that, uh, in the last 50 years, we have lost about 3 billion birds in North America alone. Most of these are insectivorous birds. So the decline in biodiversity and ecosystem function over the past 50 years uh, have decreased the ability of nature to contribute to quality of life uh, of both humans and non-humans. It is uh, pretty well established that land use and agriculture is the main driver of biodiversity loss. Uh, this is a study that was published by the Chatham House and the United Nations Environment Program, and they concluded that our global food system is the primary driver of biodiversity loss, with agriculture alone being the identifier threat to 24,000 species, 24,000 of the 28,000 uh, species that are at risk of, of extinction. That's 86%. The global rate of species extinction today is higher than the average rate over the past 10 million years. Now, uh, I think it's important to, to um, highlight here that, well, this quote actually gives you the impression that it's agriculture per se uh, what is threatening biodiversity. Uh, but um, in reality, it's not the, the fact of agriculture, but it's the intensification of agriculture. It's how we practice that agriculture, how we do that agriculture. This is a paper uh, by Ellis and colleagues that look at land use over a 12,000 year period. And it shows that, it shows that even 
12,000 years ago, nearly three quarters of the Earth land was inhabited and therefore shaped by human societies, uh, including more than 95% uh, of temperate and 90% of tropical woodlands. Now, uh, they, con they conclude in this paper that the current biodiversity crisis can seldom be explained by the loss of inhabited wildlands resulting instead from the appropriation, colonization, and intensifying use of biodiversity, biodiverse cultural landscapes long shaped by sustained and sustained by prior societies. However, uh, the ideology of the separation of people and nature is still alive and well. Most, fin uh, most financial resources that go to biodiversity conservation go to the establishment of manage and, and management of reserves uh, from which people are excluded. And in this graph, you can see uh, the increase in protected areas in different regions of the world. And the graph to the, to the right is basically the loss uh, the, the decline in the, in the living planet index that I showed you before. So more protected areas, less biodiversity. Uh, these reserves are really not working. Uh, and the recent 30 by 30 initiative uh, approved by the Biodiversity COP uh, in December, last December, is no exception to this. Indeed, many, to this ideology you know, of the separation of people and, and nature. Indeed, many indigenous people, organizations, and, and conservation, cons conservationists from the global south describe this initiative as a form of green grabbing or green colonialism. Uh, the protected area approach reflects a very deep misunderstanding of the ecological principles uh, that are involved in conservation. Nature is dynamic, it's not static. Uh, the conservation of biodiversity in protected areas depend on what is going on in the surrounding areas. Uh, therefore, preserving areas of natural forest, for example, while intensifying agriculture in the surrounding areas, or the so-called land sparing approach does not work. So it is well established in ecological theory that local, extinction, local extinctions are normal and inevitable. They happen even in continuous forests. Usually, uh, this is not a problem because those areas where the local extinction happen get recolonized uh, through migration from other areas. But without migration, local extinctions turn into regional extinctions. So for example, in this slide that you see here, uh, if a species of frog, for example, goes extinct in this patch of forest, uh, it could be rescued, no? That population of frogs could be rescued from another patch of forest, but it has to migrate through that matrix. And the quality of the matrix determines the rate of migration. And so the question is whether this frog is gonna be able to make it through, no? In that patch of soybean monoculture with herbicides that, it, that that actually are very harmful to, uh, the, the, uh, to the frogs. So essentially the matrix matter. What, how, how is that matrix matters a lot for the conservation of biodiversity at the landscape level. This is an example from my, from my own research. I work in, in coffee farms and you can see two fragments of forest here and in between is this coffee farm, a very intensive coffee farm. Uh, this, this particular one is from Brazil. So, Obviously, organisms that are specialists in forests are gonna have a hard time migrating through a matrix that looks like this, but are gonna be uh, more able to migrate. The rate of migration is gonna be higher in a matrix that looks like this, which is also a coffee farm, but it's a shaded coffee farm. Now, with a lot of diversity, it looks more like a forest. And uh, so even if the, if the organism is unable to reproduce in that habitat, in that agroforestry system, it would be able to migrate to other patches of forest. So rather than displacing local populations to establish yet more protected areas that do not work, what we need to do is transform those industrial monocultural systems into diverse landscapes uh, with small scale ag agroecological farms. Unfortunately, the amount of land in industrial monoculture continues to grow up. Uh, here we see in this graph the, the increase 
in uh, these crops that are mostly produced by, uh, in this intensive monocultural plantation system. But the good news is that agroecology and alternative food systems uh, are being embraced by millions of farmers, especially in the global south, where, where the larger, a larger proportion of the population still uh, is still directly connected to the land. And a growing number of these farmers are organized into a global peasant anti-globalization movement that is fighting for, and I, I should say anti-neoliberal globalization movement uh, that is fighting for food sovereignty uh, and has agroecology uh, as one of its main pillars. Now, a question that always emerged uh, when, whenever I, I talk about this, a question that emerged is, can small-scale farmers practicing agroecology agro feed the world? No. Can they produce enough, enough food to uh, maintain us? Because, because in, in essence, you know, there's a sense that, that we need this kind of, of industrial agriculture you know, to, to produce enough food um, for people. Now, small farms represent about 90% of all the farms in the world globally, but are squeezed uh, in about a quarter of the agricultural land. Some, some, uh, some uh, other studies estimate a little bit more than that, about 30%, but more or less between 30 and, and 25% of the land. Uh, but even in these disproportionately small areas, small and medium scale farms uh, produce a larger proportion of the food that we consume. Uh, this graph here show that the smaller farms, the you know the two up to two two hectares uh, in size, are the greatest contributors to global food production compared to all other classes. And in, in the right, this, this contribution of the small-scale farms to food production, or to food availability, let's say, uh, is even more evident when you consider the macronutrients. So this is uh, carbohydrate, fats, proteins, and you can see that the majority of those are produced in the small-scale farms. And on the other hand, industrial agriculture should feed very few people uh, because it is producing it is not producing food, it's producing uh, fuel uh, and it's producing feed for animals. And of course, people eat the animals, but then it's a very small, a smaller proportion um, and a more, much more inefficient way. This, uh, this map shows the distribution of where the food is being produced and where the, the fuel and, 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 uh, and feed is produced. 55% of the world's uh, crop calories are eaten directly by people. Only 55%. Uh, 66% is used for animal feed, and 9% goes to biofuels and other industrial uses. And that brings me to the urban sphere, and I know we're going to be talking about that later on today. 55% of the population, of course, uh, of the human population lives in cities, and most of the food is produced that is consumed in the cities is produced in ur uh, rural and peri urban areas. Uh, and so, so that food goes to the cities, no? The new urban agriculture movement is helping to, to supply some of that food, but uh, more important than the amount of food that is being produced in cities is uh, the interpenetration of the urban and the rural. Between 70 and 80% of the food produced globally, mostly in rural areas, go, go to the city. And in their paper uh, on planetary urbanization, uh, Neil Brenner and Christian Smith uh, discuss the idea of the urban as a process, and that includes also the idea of extended urbanization. Those areas in the hinterlands, what they call them the hinterlands, uh, or rural areas, no, that provide food, water, and many other materials you know, for the cities. In our work, John and I uh, have examined the ecological dynamics in those rural areas and how the type of agriculture of those areas determine the quality of the matrix and ultimately the fate of, of biodiversity. Looking at this this way, you know, we can clearly see the interconnection and the inter interpenetration between the rural and the urban in determining the fate 
the faith of, uh, of biodiversity. Now, I know that many of us don't like uh, binaries, <laughs> like we were talking about yesterday. However, sometimes they're useful in making a point, which is what I want to do now. Uh, currently, we are at a crossroad. Uh, we either uh, don't do anything and continue along the easy road that leads to uh, a, the major crisis that we're experiencing in the world today uh, with industrial agriculture and industrial food systems, or we basically uh, take a different route no? and transform agriculture and food systems. Some are choosing to continue moving in the same direction, uh, even though it's, it's becoming certain that this road leads to disaster. Uh, but there are a number of people uh, that benefit from this, and they're very powerful. Uh, but on the other hand, many farming communities across the globe are engaging in agroecology and strengthening their local food systems. Uh, but this transformation is not easy, and it would not be easy, will not be easy. Uh, it will require significant changes in our food system from production to consumption, uh, and it will require radical change in our political and economic system. Uh, but since I'm an optimist, <laughs> uh, I will end with these uh, wonderful words by one of my favorite writers, uh, Arundhati Roy. She say, another world is not only possible, she's on her way, on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great segue to uh, Max. So... Max, do you, need do you want the, uh, I think so. Do you need to be at the... Oh, no, I don't need to be there. Wow, I'll be helpful. Yeah. I, I don't know how this works, to be honest, mm -hmm. so. Are you gonna be using this? Yeah. Are you listening? Uh, I don't know how the clicker works. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is the pointer, I think. Okay. I think it's, you can also control it. And you can, ah, you can no, I'm a, advance. I, I don't, I'm not, this isn't the time to learn how to use it. Um, uh, so thank you for, for this conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, esteemed colleagues who I have learned a lot from and who, uh, in fact, have more than adequately covered uh, the specific uh, a lot of uh, the specifics of the global food system, uh, the logic of in situ conservation, the logic of uh, small scale peasant farming and its role in socio ecological planning. Uh, normally, I have to present these things in a much less learned way uh, to audiences who don't know so much about them. So I deeply appreciate um, my panelists. Uh, the, this, this slide. Um, is also connected to what my panelists were talking about. Um, it, uh, the discussion about the launch of the Green Revolution in the Philippines uh, can be accompanied by a discussion of uh, countrywide peasant insurgency, which broke out shortly <laughs> afterwards and which is depicted here uh, by someone who was uh, murdered by the Philippines government, Parts Bagani. Um, and what he has drawn here is a sketch of uh, guerrillas who basically entered the field of armed conflict uh, in reaction to the ongoing attempts of the neo-colonial government to avoid agrarian reform. Um, here, uh, I decided to go from uh, the, you know, uh, political propaganda to a different type of political propaganda drawing on uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, and I, I think an, an important aspect of uh, the question, and it uh, arose yesterday, is that uh, we cannot really have uh, discussions about global development um, unless we know where we want to go. And I don't think that can be left in uh, vagueness or uh, abstraction or throwing up our hands or um, confusion, or for that matter, a, a difficulty, the difficulties of confronting hard choices. I think we need to be very clear about where we want to go, and then we can figure out how to get there, right? And so that's what I want to uh, supplement the discussion already launched about how to get there uh, with the other two co-panelists. 
Um, and basically, it's very simple. We, need a, uh, we also need a diagnosis in order to carry out an appropriate prescription. That is, we need to understand what the world, where we are, not just where we want to go, but where we are, because there's going to be disagreements about that. We might even agree about many empirical factors describing where we are, but we might not be theorizing it the same way. So where do we want to go? Uh, this is, of course, where I want to go uh, and where other people, I think, want to go, where I hope many of you would wish to go, um, and, of course, where popular movements who I work with uh, directly and indirectly also want to go. Um, and, of course, I think it's important to be clear about that because I think uh, the best politics comes with uh, an analysis comes from uh, the search for uh, clarity, right? So uh, eco-socialism as worldwide decommodification, uh, more or less permanently sustainable patterns of production, worldwide developmental uh, conversions, that is, people having equivalent access to use values, to good things on a worldwide basis. Uh, I can't imagine any other just way to structure the world system. Uh, roughly equal per capita access to energy, roughly because different uh, biomes and different climates have different energetic needs, and equal labor distribution on a world scale. That is, people should more or less uh, be working uh, from their capacities, but more or less in equal ways. There should not be people who are working 18-hour uh, days and people who are living off uh, other people's labor. Uh, I think that's fundamentally unjust, um, and it is therefore urgent to resist it. Um, much more contentious, I think, because uh, I think it's actually a bit easier to agree about a nice world that we want. Of course, there will be disagreements, but um, the, I, I think the more knotty issue comes when we actually want to offer diagnoses of the nature of the world. Because if you actually have a wrong diagnosis, it doesn't matter what your utopia looks like. Um, you are not going to be able to act politically appropriately on a given terrain if you don't even understand, the, if you mischaracterize the terrain you're on. That is, if you're like, okay, uh, I want to get to that uh, pot at the, uh, you know, I want to get to that beautiful oasis over there, um, but you don't understand that there's a mountain in the way, it doesn't matter uh, that you have this idea of getting there. Right? So it's important to clarify it. And I think it also um, affects a lot of the way, w a lot of the debates we're in. Um, so essentially, I would say that within the, the left, let us say, within the progressive thought, there are basically two uh, diagnoses, right? Um, two varieties of capitalism, two theories about the capitalist world that are uh, proffered. Right? Uh, one proposal claims that, cap that development and capitalism is essentially not polarized, capitalism is essentially flat, um, and with secular tendencies towards worldwide proletarianization. Uh, needless to say, but I'll just say it, is that this, of course, is a position which undermines any sort of claim that we need to deal with agrarian questions front and center, especially uh, agrarian reform um, and putting small peasants at the center of a worldwide developmental project, right? Um, the second proposal claims that development is uh, inherently polarized. Um, I just put this up. I think it's indicative. I mean, these uh, unemployment rates are uh, goosed and massaged endlessly. Uh, they have uh, some connection uh, with reality. It's very difficult to actually get an accurate map of it. Um, but uh, more or less, uh, you can see uh, that there are, of course, structural tendencies towards different levels of unemployment in different regions of the world. Um, and this is precisely because development is unequally allocated. There are places that have a more or less secular tendency towards uh, relatively low unemployment, and there are places with uh, tendencies towards uh, structural, uh, structural predispositions towards a very high level of unemployment because they constitute labor reservoirs, which is actually a structuring element in maintaining uh, wage suppression on a world scale. That is, if there's huge labor, uh, labor reservoirs very much connected to lack of agrarian reform, uh, then you are going to have a pressure towards downward wages, especially in, in the periphery of the world system, which actually maintains uh, low wages in the core of the world system as well, right? Because there's always a threat. There's a threat 
of using the peripheries labor reservoirs against the core. I mean, this is uh, why there's much hullabaloo about immigration, right? Um, a central component that is of maintaining, maintaining this structural polarity is imperialism, including ecologically unequal exchange. I mean, imperialism, very roughly, is a historical stage in which strong nation states take control of the productive forces of weaker nation states. Uh, this is more or less directly uh, adapted from Amilcar Cabral. Um, and using uh, those resources to maintain the polarization of accumulation, right? This has huge ecological components, right? Um, meaning that there are uneven ecological effects of imperialism and accumulation on a world scale, right? We have the work of Timmons and Roberts showing a vastly uh, different exposure to natural disasters, uh, greater exposure to environmental toxins, pesticides, industrial waste in the periphery. This has actually been an explicit uh, neoliberal project since uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s with the initiation of the offshoring regime, greater exposure to deforestation, worse health outcomes. I mean, the empirical evidence is unassailable and it's, uh, it's very clear. Um, there's also a different, different social subjects that emerge, therefore, from these different diagnoses, right? The flat capitalism, uh, posits the northern industrial proletariat as the leading class, therefore leading to eco-socialism. Um, this is more or less what you see from um, uh, figures like uh, Matthew Huber, Andreas Malm, and so forth, right? Uh, white male working class, you know, it's very uh, doing serious struggle for eco-socialism. Um, uh, this is not reality, though, is part of the problem, right? The actual, we have not seen very many uh, successful revolutions from the northern industrial proletariat, um, basically none, right? So it, it's kind of, we have a historical, I mean, I'm, not, I'm being a little silly, but there we have historical tests of this, um, let's say, social scientific hypothesis that nevertheless keeps recurring, um, but they actually, it, the hypothesis keeps being reposited even though it keeps being proven empirically wrong. Okay, uh, we can keep it, I'll keep it at that level. Um, and, or we can have, uh, you know, a polarized capitalism relies on, uh, produces a semi-proletariat, that is people who are partially proletarianized, um, we're involving peasants, peripheral industrial labor, third world working class women who are very involved in biodiversity conservation um, as the leading class in a transformation towards a different world. I mean, this is a classic theory of the weak link, but it's also, I think, very much uh, implicit or rather explicit in a lot of what my co-panelists are discussing in terms of who is a leading force towards social transformation, in situ biodiversity preservation, uh, worldwide movement of peasants. Um, and that this force, this uh, political force, is in fact uh, the primary uh, constitutive historical agent towards a transformation in the world system, right? Um, so uh, if we take that as a given, um, of course, you know, you cannot take it as a given during the Q&A, but for now I'm going to take it as a given, right? Um, is what does this imply in the North, right? For people in this room, the we, we were discussing yesterday. It does not imply that there is no uh, meaningful struggle for uh, changing our patterns of production and consumption, right? Uh, we can have and should have decommodification of all necessary services, uh, improvements in the quality along with the ecological lightening of uh, all the use values we need, including health infrastructure, consumer goods, agriculture, um, energy. I think this is very much possible. This is what I uh, tried to sketch out in my book, A People's Green New Deal. I have a couple chapters about it. I mean, I think it's eminently possible in the food system where the food we eat is both terrible and um, very, very ecologically intensive, right? Our patterns of industrialization in the place like the United States are bonkers. We have to buy new iPhones every year and so forth, right? But there's also other aspects, right? We have to actually connect rather than um, ignore the demands of the South, right? Where, uh, which means anti-imperialism because uh, war is actually constitutive of the social fabric and political fabric of the world system, but it is also therefore constitutive of the day-to-day -day of many people in the third world who live in wars that are created by the North, right? And a political program towards uh, just ecological transformation should actually account for that. That means being explicit about demilitarization, right? Rather than um, ignoring it or considering it optional. And it means engaging with climate that debt, that is massive climate reparations, uh, from the north 
to the South, right? This is how we actually deal with the colonial legacy rather than just talking about the colonial legacy. Um, the southern face of the struggle are things like sovereign industrialization, that is, every country needs to determine the, the fabric of its uh, industrial needs, uh, agrarian reform. I should have put agrarian reform two or three more times in spite of my co-panelists insisting on it, but I think we can never insist too much on agrarian reform. It's actually the fundamental necessary structural transformation uh, in the South. Um, national liberation, delinking, uh, and countrywide ecological planning. I mean, I think we actually saw this in practice to some extent, for example, during the Sandinista revolution. Um, and I, I think it's very feasible. Um, and so this is about, the in the North, it's about building up uh, support for those projects, which means understanding that historically there is a pattern within which things like the Sandinista revolution were uh, leveled and distorted and deformed and, and uh, malshaped by uh, policies that emanated from here, right? So when we talk about we and when we talk about over there, we're actually talking about a connected world um, and we have to talk about how if we want other people to also participate in a worldwide struggle for a different world system, right, and a different pattern of ecological and social planning, then it also means there is a corollary political task up here that cannot be sidestepped, right, because otherwise those projects are going to be deformed and have to advance against the gale force of a great deal of violence, right, which is inevitably um, distorting. Um, this, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, it touch on briefly degrowth. Some things are that this on a world scale also means some things are growing and other things are going to degrow. And I want to end on a slightly polemical note, which I hope is not too out of place in uh, this conference. But um, it's, uh, this is actually a direct quotation from uh, Greta Thunberg. And it's not, my point is rather not that uh, this is a uh, discourse necessary, necessary to fully adopt in uh, fora like this conference, but it's rather to pose it as a challenge to us. How do we, how do we interact with affirmations like this? Do we treat them as a polemic that doesn't require any form of response from us? Or do we treat it as a spur to forms of uh, concept formation towards uh, lines of theoretical inquiry um, and towards forms of political action that can say, okay, there are valid points there and therefore they are part of constructing a different world. There are valid points that we have to take into account, otherwise we risk reproducing fundamental uh, inequalities and uh, exploitations and deprivations that are currently endemic to the world system. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, all three. Excellent timekeeping. <coughs> um, we have, I guess, 45 minutes, more or less, half hour. Half my, hour. my former student is the, <laughs> now the hierarchical. We have 32 minutes. Yeah, okay. Then what we're going to do is just collect questions, three or four questions, and then give it to the panel, and then we'll do another round. So. You call in people, we'll bring the mics. Here, here in the front. Thank you very much for, is it working? Yes, we're working. So. Okay. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, uh, so I'm going to, of all the points, I'm going to basically address my question to Yvette for what you mentioned. I'm thinking of the case for, I'm, I'm from Iran, so I'm thinking of all these applications to, uh, to Iran and um, also in Chicago. So I think the question of production is part of that. I'm sure you skipped that because of the time limits, but it also relates to the question of waste and consumption of diversity, all these kind of uh, trends of um, encouraging limitations of use. For example, some, some kind of food is bad for you, some kind of food is better. So all these trends impact that. Plus, I think it also relates to the question of distribution. For example, from Iran, from the local um, cities, I know that people grow a lot of crops, but they usually end up in waste because there's no system for circulation of them, even to the local communities. 
And when you think of these governments, a lot of them have political issues with community empowerment. So it's not just about short-sighted, or from what I see, short-sighted. They are short-sighted about the, the agricultural needs, but they're also really scared of empowering communities to kind of circulate or to get together or decide about their agricultural needs because that community empowerment has social political um, outcomes that they are scared of. So this, I think this question of the form of agriculture is also tightly political and related to social political oppression. John and then uh Nicole. Uh, basically, to follow up on that question, um, Yvette, you talked about the, the pattern that's very well known now, where small-scale agriculture actually produces more than large-scale agriculture, which is the kind of thing that sometimes seems surprising to people, since the whole idea of modernizing agriculture had to do with increasing the scale and the underlying assumptions that we always seem to have about, uh, about scale effects. So this is very, it's a well-known problem. It's been talked about by a lot of people, uh, yet nobody seems to have, um, in not my reading of the literature at least, uh, there's very little explanation as to why it occurs. I know that you have some ideas about, about ecological reasons as to why it uh, occurs, and maybe you could share that with the people here. And then Nicole in the corner, Nicole Whalen. Um, I guess my question is about eco-socialism and also land reform. So I think when we think of socialism, we think of the you know, socialization of property or the collectivization of property and land, um, which seems a little bit at odds with my understanding of how the agroecology approach um, proceeds, which is maybe about supporting small-scale farmers. Or um, So it seems like there's some role of private property on that model. So I was just wondering if you could say more about that and also how we should think or approach questions of land reform that support these agroecology um, efforts. And then the last question in the back before we'll let the... Hi, Josh Leposky. Um, I have a question for Max, and I, let me just preface it with, uh, I think, you know, broadly I'm in agreement with uh, pretty much everything that you're saying there. Um, I'm, you know, I heard your sort of call for theoretical or conceptual development of lines of thinking, and I'm also struck by your claim about the need for a having a correct diagnosis uh, in order to know where in quotes, we want to go, which seems to me to imply some sort of theory of access to the, the truth or fact. And, and, and yet, you know, the history and philosophy of science and, and other fields show us that when the stakes are high, there's no agreement <laughs> on what the truth is. So I'm just, if you would mind speaking to some extent on how you or how we again in quotes figure out who's got the correct diagnosis so uh, how about should i start is this working well okay uh okay the question about well you had a lot of different things there but i'm gonna answer your question about production by answering John's question as well at the same time, uh, there, is, there is this well-known inverse productivity size relationship that uh, have been studied by, by rural sociologists and economists for a long time. Amar Sen uh, was the first one to identify this in the context of India. And it's the fact that that small that, that you produce more in smaller scale. So John's, John's question was about why is this, you know, what, what is the reason for that? And ecologically, uh, well, ecologically and socially as well, because it has to do with, with the small scale farmers basically having an intimate knowledge of their land, no? They know every little piece of their land, and so they kind of optimize for that, no? If there's a patch, down there that is a very, very uh, a moist, is, is uh, 
waterlog or something like that, they plant something that can resist that waterlogging. Uh, in an area that is more dry or that has certain weeds, they plant things that, that work well for that. And also they engage a lot in polycultures that also tend to be uh, more efficient from an ecological point of view. And so, uh, I mean, a friend of ours, Yahya Chappelle, used to say that, that small-scale uh, peasant pro uh, producers uh, are, are practicing a, a, Como se dice, es, eh, ay. <laughs> my, my English is, is falling out. Uh, John, what, ¿cómo se dice? Del, <laughs> no, no, intensify. No. Well, I mean, anyway, let me, let me, it will come later on. Uh, you know, the big machines with, with GIS and that go through the. Precision agriculture, that's the word, yeah. So, Small-scale farmers are practicing precision agriculture, you know, and they've been always practicing precision agriculture. Uh, you don't need those big machines. But the thing is that, you know, in large-scale agriculture, you have these big machines precisely, and then you, you, you go through an area that um, you have to treat the entire area the same way, despite of the fact that there, are a lot of, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the soil. So those are some of the reasons why you have, uh, you have this, this kind of uh, a higher production you know, per area in the smaller farms. Uh, you mentioned the waste, and of course, waste is a huge thing. Uh, we, today, we produce more than enough food to feed everybody, for everybody, to satisfy the needs, the nutritional needs of, of everybody. Um, but there's a lot of waste and the food is not distributed equally and people don't have access to it and can't afford to buy it, no? So it's not an issue of how much we produce. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, there, there is uh, a lot of work that has been done related to, to waste and the fact that we, we need to we need to uh, reduce the waste. And the waste is, is different in different parts of the world. Obviously, in, in the global south, you have a, a, a lot of food is wasted because of lack of refrigeration and things like that. In the global north, there's like, you know, a lot of food is wasted at the, at the household level as well. So there's different, you know, it's, it has different manifestation in different places. And finally, you talk about, or you ask about the social political um, system, and uh, and I think that uh, well, Max mentioned land reform, uh, which obviously governments, uh, you know, governments are responding to uh, a particular a particular set of people in in their countries. No, usually the ones that have the most power, and so. Uh, when you have a government that is a, a government that, that's, that has a lot of investment in, in the, the powerful class and you have peasant movements going on, they're going to be repressing those peasant movements. It's, it's, and, and, and so that's what we're seeing. When we see that over and over again. Uh, so those uh, type of uh, repression of peasant movements, I think uh, obviously are gonna continue. You know, we see that in many parts of the world. We have seen it in the past, we will we'll see it in the future as well. But I think that uh, part of the, what, what the peasant movement is doing is basically trying to, to gain more power to be able to overthrow those governments, no? And put in place governments that are more uh, uh, responsive to, to the needs of the, of the peasantry. So, I guess Max? Yeah, great. Um, thank you for these questions. So, in, in terms of this question about um, the role of private property, uh, I think it, uh, I think I don't think it can be kind of stipulated a priori ahead of concrete processes of struggle for changing the distribution of property. Uh, you know, I think historically we have many different experiences with uh, socialist construction, uh, with 
which have attempted various types of uh, forms of the social ownership of property and also individual ownership of property have moved from one to the other under various pressures. Um, and a lot of them have accepted various, for example, the new economic policy and the Soviet Union. I mean, it was broadly accepted that there would be uh, private ownership of uh, means of production in land for a period of time, right? And then that, that ended for a variety of reasons with uh, somewhat negative and somewhat positive results depending on what one prioritizes, right? Um, and it's, of course, a classic debate um, in agrarian studies as well between uh, populist and other approaches. So I, I, don't, I don't actually think that there is uh, a, an answer for it outside of the concrete forms of struggle and what they demand. I mean, I think, uh, you know, you have a democratizing, um, economically and socially democratizing tendency when you are carrying out a land redistribution. Of course, in my ideal world, this is carrying this uh, is uh, occurring with more and more levels of uh, vertical cooperativization, um, and I think there's a lot of uh, benefits toward. I think you also have a endemic tendency towards cooperative forms of production in uh, various forms of rural uh, social production. I mean, I think that's the long-standing process. We, again, but what it looks like on the ground, we don't know. Um, it has to be produced in practice and it has to be produced in a way that's not, uh, that is generally non-coercive towards people who don't have that much control over the means of production. If people don't want to be in cooperatives, I don't think it's a good idea to force them into it. That's like, that's my opinion in general. I mean, unless you have to like beat the Nazis or something, right? There sometimes could be exigencies, but in general, I don't, I don't think it should be forced, um, which means that there have to be political project, projects that, uh, figure out ways that they can be shown to be beneficial to people's day-to-day uh, -day rural, day-to-day uh, -day social reproduction needs, right? So, um, and so this is a question also of politics and not just policy. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, in terms of the, the role of uh, agrarian reform, I mean, I think, you know, I think, uh, of course, it, it just has to be central, I mean, and it also has to be central not when, not in the abstract, but in the concrete, right? I mean, to take the major post-Cold War experience of agrarian reform in the entire world was in Zimbabwe. Uh, there was a massive redistribution of land from white settlers to uh, black uh, slum dwellers and uh, semi-proletarians and farm workers and people who held very small amounts of land. Um, and uh, the, the result is that Zimbabwe is under uh, sanctions, having nothing to do with democratization and having a lot to do with, in fact, social democratization, democratization of the means of production. I mean, this is not widely discussed or even acknowledged, right? Um, and I think this is uh, something we need to be aware of because, of course, uh, we agree on the panel, at least, that agrarian reform is actually one of the central mechanisms for, towards uh, long-term just ecological planning as part and parcel of uh, resolving the climate crisis through popular control over the farming process, right? So I think we need to take it into account. In, in terms of um, this question of uh, what we do and don't know, I mean, I think, you know, of course, there, there's a lack of agreement but this doesn't mean that all truths are equally unknown, right? Um, it will be, uh, you know, I think this is pretty much agreed upon as well that, you know, we have very, we have grades of truthiness. Um, and, uh, you know, of course this doesn't, of course when it comes to things that have political stakes, there are wider realms of disagreement, but that doesn't mean all the disagreements are equally meritorious. Um, and so I'm a firm believer in kind of a critical realist social scientific inquiry where we can at least roughly approximate uh, truth, uh, needing always more investigation and keeping things open and being prepared to learn more about lots of certain social processes, but understanding that historically speaking, we can move closer at least to truth and understanding that, of course, political uh, struggle cannot be held in, in suspension uh, until we have it, an absolute or close to absolute truth in our possession. Helen, did you want to chime in? 
Sure. I think I would just um, kind of second that uh, HPS or history and philosophy of science uh, uh, skepticism coming from the perspective of um, being inclined to think about about questions at a very granular scale uh, in in kind of my own in my own um, uh, work and and the work that I engage with and thinking about it's not just like when the stakes are high and with respect to the big questions that there's disagreement about about the facts on the ground or how to move forward from them it's really also at the you know, the micro scale on up, um, that things are, are hard to know, even among people who are, you know, kind of politically on the same page. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Neil. I got one, if I may. Yeah. I just wanted to ask the panel to speak to the, um, just your ideas about the spatial organization of agrarian reform especially in relation to urbanization and kind of large population centers. Because we know from like the kind of critical literature that, you know, the green revolution and the megacity are kind of two sides of the same coin. And we usually don't recognize that in the literature because they're, they're like fetishized. You know, you have sort of agrarian studies oftentimes in, in one realm that treats it as a distinct territorial arena. And then especially in urban studies, which I work in, it just completely treats cities as kind of an autonomous realm when we know that the kind of massive expansion of cities that Yvette, you alluded to is completely connected to a particular way of kind of high intensity industrial agriculture and that there are relational connections between those spaces and the processes and the kinds of crisis tendencies, tendencies that emerge. So I know that the panelists have written on this, but I just think if we're gonna talk about agrarian reform in relation to the broader environmental dynamics, the spatiality of it is really important. Are we talking about a sort of Mumfordian peri-urban agrarian system? Are we talking about large-scale commodity chains, but somehow organized in a more agroecological way? Are we talking about urban or city-based agriculture, or all of the above in some, some other you know, territorial configuration? You want to start with me? You go out. No, we're going ah, uh, oh. to uh, collect. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Just um, write down when you. Max brought up this great question about um, the agents of struggle and revolutionary change and thinking about flat capitalism and polarized and observed that, um, you know, Matt Huber's book talks about the white working class as this agent. Uh, great point that we don't have empirical evidence from, from history of that happening recently. Um, and on that vein, I was wondering about the Arab Spring, um, and I've been wondering about this for a while, and I'm excited that I get to ask somebody with expertise in this area. What does that tell us about this question of who's going to be the agent of revolutionary struggle? What's the diagnosis and the lessons from that uh, recent experience? So in a previous life, I was a rural sociologist. Um, it was a very, very weird time. Um, and it seemed to me one of the things that I picked up about American farming is they're intensely cooperative. They're intensely community-based, particularly the small farmers. And even the, plur especially the pluriactive farmers who have to make money off the farm rely on relationships of mutual aid with their boss and there is a way of speaking about private property and independent farmers that I think elides, erases, and misses the extent to which they are actually deeply cooperative. They, are, they, they do a great deal, they just name it differently, and this is the question of facts. Um, and I find that when I talk to my rural students, um, I teach at Central Michigan University, which is in the middle of nowhere, um, for a kid from Jersey, um, they understand how tight-knit their neighborhoods are. They understand the identification of place. They understand how much their parents know about the, the space of their farms. That there's a way of speaking with them that gets through, that I think frequently gets missed when we talk about crisis, and I, this is one of the questions I had about the crisis narrative. It's the crisis narrative at the global and how we talk about crises at the local that really sort of presents, the first one erases what people know in their daily lives. 
and speaking about crises and conditions and relations in the immediacy of their lives is a way of accessing a crisis discourse that's politicizing. And, and, and if you could talk about that morass. I have one more question in the back. And By the way, just a reminder, we should identify ourselves when we ask the question. <laughs> Um, my name is Tom Lamar. I'm actually in Cinema and Media Studies, so maybe my question's not surprising. So I really enjoyed these diagnoses and largely agree with them, but I also wonder about the mediation of infrastructures, both transportation and telecommunications, which really are responsible for a lot of militarized accumulation, uh, distribution of sovereignty, as well as formation of general intellect. And I, I just wonder how we account for those kinds of mediation that we don't fall back into a sense that we're just dealing immediately with these problems. So, anyone want to volunteer to be the... Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go from left to right. That we are used to being on the right, so... <laughs> All right, that means me, I guess. Yes. Great. Um, thanks for, we'll thanks for those questions. I'll, I'll tackle some of the um, things that, that um, I think relate specifically to what I was thinking and, and speaking about today. Um, the first I want to reflect on the sort of nature of farming in the United States. And I think, I, think I, I, you know, I, 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 um, I agree with, with that characterization of some aspects of rural rural American um, farming communities uh, and the ways in which they um, imagine their past and futures uh, and the importance that, that, that community has within that. I would, I would think that one of the challenges um, or, or one of the other pieces of that puzzle is the extent to which um, many kinds of industrial farming rely on transient and migrant labor and that that's also a kind of community apart from those other communities and yet also central to it. And so I, I do think that, that that's a very divided, you know, the sense of community there is, is very divided and that's, that's obviously deeply problematic. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and that's true of, of um, uh, especially I think in, in animal agricultural industries, um, but, but true more generally. So, so where, for your students, where does transient labor fit into their visions of community? But then thinking about the question of um, connecting crises at, at the local and, and global level, I was thinking about this from the perspective of, of actually kind of the work that historians are doing right now um, to show um, much more significantly the way in which agricultural transformations um, have been connected across uh, national transnational contexts. Um, so thinking about rewriting the history of, of the Green Revolution, um, both from the perspective of you know, South-South exchange, from the perspective of uh, how, how you know, visions of transforming the US South became um, um, part of the, the dynamic of, of instituting agricultural development elsewhere. Um, and I think you know, that understanding that deep history uh, can be part of talking about the interconnectedness of, of these crises. Um, and I, I do think a lot of kind of good work is working in that direction. The question is how to make that part of a larger, a larger narrative and imaginary. Um, and then I think this question about infrastructure is so important. Um, and one of the images that I showed um, was of uh, the extension service guy, you know, holding up the, the box of seeds. And perhaps it was obvious, or I don't remember how I captioned the photograph, but that was taken on a train. And so one of the, 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 the literal vehicle for uh, agricultural extension uh, across the early um, uh, 20th century United States was 
uh, taking extension on the train line. So the, that was the corn seed gospel train was spreading, was evangelizing about, about seed care and quality, right? But there were other kinds of examples of the way infrastructure was actually the way knowledge uh, transformed and, and went around. Um, so it's not just that you know, we have like new infrastructure and telecommunications things that are changing agriculture, but in fact, that's, that's a part of the longer history. And to, 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 to not be thinking seriously about how the decisions we make moving forward relate to those infrastructural um, patterns is, is um, obviously an issue. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to address the question about uh, land reform. I think Neil uh, asked about the, the, the speciality of, uh, of land reform. And it made me think about uh, the MST. And the MST is the, the landless movement in Brazil, one of the big, well, the biggest landless, uh, the biggest move, social movement in, in Brazil, and one of the biggest in the world. And uh, not just in Brazil, but in many of the cities uh, in, uh, in the global south and in the north as well, have grown through uh, the displacement of people from the countryside. No? Industrial agriculture uh, have dis dispossessed people from their land, and uh, those people end up going to the cities. Uh, and so those, those areas uh, of uh, poverty that we see in the favelas in Brazil, for example, but in, in, in many of the barrios in, in throughout the world, uh, are people that, that come from those rural areas, no? So there's, there's a, that connection initially. Uh, and then when you uh, insert land reform into this, this um, scenario, in Brazil, for example, many of the people that have been involved in these uh, land takeovers uh, are people that actually are either sons and daughters from people that were displaced or they themselves have been displaced and were living in the city. And eventually they end up uh, having land, you know, through the process of land, land reform. Initially, uh, the MST was all about acquiring land and redistributing land. You know? But then eventually, uh, the, the, the people that, uh, these families that acquire land uh, needed also to have some, some sort of organization. You know? it's, it's not just you know, gaining the access to the land, but then what do you do with it and all that. And many uh, of them began realizing that the industrial mode of production, uh, that you know, this intensive agricultural system was not uh, a good alternative for them. Uh, and so they, uh, the MST evolved from uh, being a movement that was involved in, in basically acquiring land and, and distributing, making sure that people uh, had access to land, to a movement that incorporated agroecology as one of their main pillars, and not just the issue of how food is produced, but how it is distributed and all that. And because many of the people actually were coming from urban areas, then there was this connection with the urban. So it's kind of a, a looking back or a, a way back no, to, the, to the cities no? with the connections that people have with families in the cities uh, and, and so establishment of, of new markets in the cities uh, from these new areas uh, that were uh, beneficiaries of the, of the land reform. So obviously there are these connections, very, very deep connections between uh, the, in, in terms of spatial connections you know, between the, the social, I mean, the, the, uh, the rural and the urban. Thanks. Yeah, um, so thank you for these questions. I'm gonna, I wanna address that question also in a bit of a, of a different way. Uh, you know, I know uh, there have been successful experiences with um, this term that uh, rankles a lot of people, unfortunately, with repeasantization in uh, Brazil and also uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, it's been a lot less successful, I think, in uh, Venezuela for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I think it, it raises the question, both of the prospects and the difficulties of uh, if people want, in fact, to go back to the land, 
what it means. Um, but also the broader question of, is there a development model for the third world that does not involve some kind of uh, draining of these uh, labor reservoirs? I mean, how are people, people are not going to be involved in an ideal typical uh, industrial to service sector uh, economy like you sort of have in the United States and Europe, right? That is, you know, the amount, there's uh, would be massive overproduction of industrial goods. Um, and there's just no prospect for labor absorption. So how are people going to have decent and fulfilling lives on a worldwide scale without uh, having uh, some form of agrarian reform that in a very substantial scale involves people in third world cities, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an open question and there's, a open, uh, there's serious experiments with it. Some of them are successful, right, with the Semtecha, um, and some of them unsuccessful, and so it's something that needs to be uh, seriously considered in terms of thinking about uh, rural urban balance for development planning um, going forward. Uh, in terms of um, what happened in the Arab region, uh, it served, it, the primary agents, I think, of the, of the processes of change, which I, are not really called anymore in the Arab region, the Arab revolutions, except on, in Anglophone social media, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, uh, were probably more of a declasse, uh, downward, downwardly mobile, urban, uh, petty bourgeois, primarily, with some role for the agrarian sector. I mean, and, uh, in fact, it started to some extent in Tunisia with um, uh, indebted farmers, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, who immolated himself uh, after uh, the, the bank repossessed his land that he had heavily invested in his family had heavily invested in for purposes of um, export-oriented, uh, heavily irrigated agriculture. So there was a strong agrarian component in certain places and in certain times. Um, in Tunisia, uh, to some extent, in, uh, in Egypt, um, in, in Yemen, I don't know that it's been adequately tracked, but Yemen is, of course, an overwhelmingly agrarian country, so it's a little different there. Um, in Syria, it was uh, often in the slums of cities that the uh, up, up unrest occurred. Um, so it, it's a mix, but I, do, I think it's yeah, I think it's a lot of kind of declasse, downwardly mobile people who could not find a place in uh, various authoritarian social compacts. Um, and I think it's worthwhile also that we, uh, you know, most people I know and uh, talk to in Tunisia would actually advocate a return to the authoritarian capitalist model uh, of the pre-revolution, not because they like it, but because the current situation is a total attack on social reproduction and they're much poorer than they were 11 years ago. Right, um, and so there is, a, I believe, a widespread. Uh, I believe it's not just Tunisia. I think it's very widespread. I mean, I think Yemen is one exception, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, you know, there's actually been a great deal of social decomposition and rollback um, in the last 13 years, rather than any form of, of events. I think we we're done. Can we just have a round of appreciation for our panel? <laughs>